from Australia and specifically from an hour away from Brisbane. Uh, Brisbane is uh, on the East Coast, about an hour flight north of Sydney, if you're not sure where that is, uh, where Brisbane is. So um, originally from Brisbane, did a PhD in quantum computing uh, in Brisbane, University of Queensland. Then after that, once you, uh, if you want to stay in academia, you look for postdocs, uh, typically outside your country. They, they kind of encourage you to do that. Um, the good thing too, actually, is uh, at least when I left, which was 2009, I've been here now just over 10 years or 12 years. They, if you left the country, you never had to pay back your school fees, your school uh, debt. So I thought that sounds great, but uh, they changed it two years ago and they're after us. So they, they came for me and uh, I have to pay that back now. So because uh, they, they through your tax, so they assume you're going to go back to Australia. But as soon as I came to Toronto and Canada, I just loved it and never wanted to, to leave. So that was uh, kind of the strategy. But initially after PhD, got a um, postdoc position initially in, in Boston. And again, working on quantum computing. At Xanadu, we're building a quantum computer, but based on light or photonics, photons. So I was uh, working in that field. Then after Boston, came to do a postdoc at University of Toronto. And uh, as soon as I kind of was here for the first few months, just loved it. Um, where I'm from is just farmland. And so uh, I was there for many years. So I love the sort of big city sort of feel and mm -hmm. love Canada's a lot of similarities between Canada and Australia too. So it didn't feel felt different, but not crazy different, which was uh, enjoyable as well. And then, um, you know, during that whole time of PhD and postdoc, I was always thinking about maybe commercializing the research community that I was part of that research. Um, and so after two postdocs at U of T it's, that's two years each. So four years, um, you know, if you want to become a prof, typically you have to find some, you know, small town somewhere, somewhere in the world, because it's hard to find professorships. It's really challenging, definitely in Toronto uh, as well. So I, I, and I wanted to stay in Toronto and I was always thinking about commercializing. So after that, um, decided, well, I'd like to stay here. Uh, I don't have a job at university and love to start a company. So initially started uh, a company called uh, Cypher Q, and that was about commercializing quantum photonics or quantum light in um, for security purposes. So not computing, but security. So you can actually use quantum computing, the benefits of quantum computing for many applications and security is one. And so I was doing that for two years. Um, I was part of, at that point, the DMZ and would go have a sort of desk there. I was just myself and went there every day um, and tried to meet people and get things started. Got a couple of contracts with... Um, Boeing, uh, just to hire one person. So, so did that and, and so forth. And then um, was hearing, went, went to uh, uh, CDL, tried to get Cypher Q in there, but uh, didn't get in <laughs> and then um, got rejected there. And then, but it was also quantum computing. This is about 2026 was CDL was starting to get more interested in quantum computing rather than quantum security. And quantum computing, there's a couple of companies getting funded. Not like it is five years later, like today, but it was one or two. So some of the investors in the early days, you can think of an investor as being your customer. That they were asking, well, what about quantum computing? Can you do that? Because we would be more interested in that. And hmm. you know, my PhD in research was in security and computing. So um, had CypherQ, then started Xanadu. So I had two at the same time, just to see what would take off. In, in terms oh, of raising okay. money. Yeah, and then uh, CDL welcomed Xanadu part, the quantum computing part, because there's more interest. So I did that and then went through the first year of CDL. That was actually in the AI stream. I kind of didn't know where to put us, um, but it was the first, it was the last, it was the year before the first year they started the quantum stream. Uh, so the year after they started a quantum uh, specific stream. So, but we were the year before and then uh, managed to, you know, slow process, uh, managed to get OMAs to invest in us. Uh, uh, I mean, a small check of 2 million. That, that felt like all the money in the world. It's still, we raised a hundred million six months ago through mm -hmm. Best of Capricorn Tiger. Still that first 2 million feels like all the money in the world. Um, it, it felt just unbelievable. And seeing it in the bank when you log in, it didn't feel real. So that was, that was really amazing. So having that money could start hiring people, which is always a good thing. And then just went from there. Uh, so that's kind of the, you know, how, how we started. So we have a pretty technical audience today. Um, mostly other founders and, and folks working in very, uh, you know, technical due diligence, part of the investing world, but 
In case we have anyone here who, like me, may not fully grasp the difference between quantum computing and quantum security versus quantum photonics and how all that works, can you give us just the for dummies version of what Xanadu is building? For sure. Um, so you can imagine anything in life. You can break things down in life to matter or light, roughly speaking. So matter, think of electrons. And that's where you get the word electronics from. We use electrons, so digital stuff. You know, our computers we're using now so and then you have light so think of the sun think of a laser pointer uh whatnot so anything that has photons in it you have those two things and we're all kind of made up of of them now everything that we see in our uh, around our world is based on newton's laws of physics so what we call classical physics and all of technology is based on these laws you know, they don't worry about quantum computing. But if you zoom into something and, and see it at its fundamental part, an electron or a photon, then these things have quantum physics uh, that govern them. So there's laws of quantum physics that govern them. Now, the reason I bring that up is you kind of combine two things. You combine a, a flashlight, and then if you strip away the light and you get down a photonic layer, level, it has different properties. It has, electro, uh, it has uh, entanglement and superposition. Now, these, these two properties, these features don't occur in the everyday world. The famous one is Schrodinger's cat. It's either dead or alive. You don't walk down the street and, and see the cat dead and alive at the same time. You, hopefully, I've never seen a dead cat, thankfully, but I'm sure they exist. But in the quantum world, if you had the analogy on a photon, you can have a photon that's dead or alive at the same time. More specifically, a photon that's over there and over here at the same time. It doesn't mean two photons. It actually means it's in those places at the same time, hence the dead or alive cat analogy. So um, that's what happens. Now, if you can leverage these properties that happen at the very small scale, which is very hard to do, then you can actually use those properties to do some really amazing things that non-quantum, our everyday technology can do. So for instance, if you can leverage these weird properties, you can actually create, in principle, unbreakable security between two people. Another thing you can do if you can leverage these properties and build a machine, you can leverage them for, for computing as well. And what that means is for certain problems, you can actually speed up the tasks much, much faster. Now there's two things, speeding up a task. And the other one is, is not only speeding it up, but accessing solutions that you know, you'd have to run a, a supercomputer mm -hmm. to the end of eternity to get the answer. So intractable problems. So that's what's exciting about it. And, and it's, that's kind of, you know, how, how it works. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, so one of the things that uh, comes a lot, uh, comes up a lot with this audience is, you know, finding product market fit as a deep tech startup when you're spending so much time and money on research and on product development. Can you just like take us back um, or if you're still there, tell us about it too. But if you can take us back to kind of when you were building the product um, before you turned the corner, finding a customer for it or how, how that journey happened for you. Yeah, there's two phrases I hate, product market fit and revenue. I don't All right. Know, I don't know why we have to it. Yeah, I don't know why you have to worry about these things. Uh, but yeah, I can only speak from the deep, deep tech side of quantum. It is... So going back to that story, one of the challenges why investors weren't interested in quantum security is because the market wasn't there yet, but the technology was. It's a much simpler device to build. Why they were invest interested in quantum computing is that once you build one of these computers, which is very, very hard to do, the market will open up. So at least in quantum computing and maybe in other deep tech ones, but in quantum computing for sure, you can you need to find investors that are willing to take a long-term bet. So they're like, and we're upfront with that as well. We don't say we have something today when we don't, when, you know, it's not going to be here for three, four, five years time. So you've got to be honest about that. And, and there are investors like that, you know, the, the moonshot investors and, you know, portfolios, they're the ones that we go after. And in that case, the time horizons are not, you know, next year or the year after it's maybe five to 10 years away. And they're willing to bet a certain part of their funds on that. So having an honest discussion about that and where the technology is, then you don't need to worry as much about revenue and product market fit today. Having said that, you know, we're actually, you know, we raised six months ago because of the market conditions are, are really good. We're thinking of raising again now. We've pretty much started it, but we can take our time. But 
the reason I bring that up is you still have to sort of say, well, you know, our revenue, you know, this year, I think is 2 million, something like that next year, 4 million. But by 2025, it's, it, hopefully it'll be hundreds of millions of dollars, because if you look at each year underlying where the revenue is, and it goes up in the traditional exponential sort of way, you have the technology uh, improvements and breakthroughs. So it's correlated with that, which is no surprise. Um, so that's how we talk about it. We do have to talk about product market fit, but it is in the, in the, in the sort of end revenue, but it is in like, what does it look like in four or five years time? And we have examples of that. We have revenue, you know, you kind of put something together and, and, and in terms of the product market fit, well, you know, it's still unclear, but with this large amount of computational resources, there is a fundamental belief by a lot of people that, okay, it'll be useful for something. There's, you know, there's got to be something for all these amazing power of computing, but we do know some examples. There's uh, typically four categories like logistics, speeding up certain problems in terms of, you know, it's kind of interesting when you're delivering, uh, you know, AWS is delivering, Amazon is delivering parcels. It actually is kind of cool. It's, you know, as you got more and more parcels, more and more customers, more and more stops, it actually is, a, is an optimization problem. that's quite challenging as it gets to a larger scale. New drugs is another one. Um, the, increasing the, the speed up of, of and delivery of drugs. Another one is uh, better batteries. That's one we're focused on is uh, you know, investigating next generation batteries. So the, all these problems we do know in terms of the getting back to the product market fit. Um, but, you know, it's funny, like in the 70s, a personal computer, if you look at some of the early examples, they would say, say this is like 75, they would say, you know, back in those days, a housewife, it'll be great to have a computer to look at the menu for housewives. And it's, it's crazy, right, to think that was because they didn't know that yeah. in the late 70s, spreadsheets and, and um, Word docs, Word processes started you know, for businesses. So it started taking off even more. Two years later, IBM entered and because of those two applications. So the moral of the story is you never know a technology. Uh, so we're all hopeful it's going to be things we'd never thought of, but we're kind of in the phase at the moment of maybe the menu sort of thing. But so we do have some examples. And so, but in terms of how you actually uh, organize your team, um, how much go to market do you have um, as a ratio, say, compared to um, product development, fundamental research, other activities you guys are doing to actually build the technology? Yeah, I think quantum is, uh, at least for us, is very extreme in that. So we've hit 100 people uh, now, I think last week. Uh, I would say 80 to 85 would be pure kind of R&D, you know, right. people. Right. And that, that can also be broken up in hardware, software development, you know, for quantum stuff, uh, quantum software, uh, creating the cloud infrastructure. We have our own quantum cloud as well. So all of that. And there's a lot of um, what I would say is traditional classical developers, you know, front end developers, back end developers that are working in quantum, but they could work anywhere. And then the other 15%, 10, 15% would be, you know, people that are working on finance, legal, patents. And then we have, we're building out this now, having said all that, we, we have probably five people working on business development and the traditional sort of product market side of things. Mm -hmm. um, so that's maybe four or five. So it's a small percent or 5%. Mm -hmm. And that'll be built out over the coming six months as well. But it's all about, can we keep producing in our deep tech environment? Um, the, 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 you know, are we getting more and more qubits? Are we getting the fault tolerance? These are the things that will define a successful quantum hardware company. And so that's why it's really skewed, uh, significantly yeah. skewed in that way. Yeah. And we'll move to a few, um, we'll move to audience questions. And, and just so you guys know, we're going to shut off the recording as soon as we pivot to questions from all of you founders. Uh, the reason for that is because we want you and Christian to be able to be really candid. Um, you know, there's only 35 of us on the call here. Um, uh, but just one or two more quick questions here, Christian. So. Um, the, the breakdown is super helpful um, thinking about where you guys are at. Now, the, the big question to me is like, how do you, then how do you know on an average Tuesday when you kind of like, you've got your head down, you look up and you think like, are we moving fast enough or are we moving um, too slow? How do you actually measure your progress um, uh, compared to like a more conventional, I guess, startup building software or consumer, like you can just tell if it's selling more than the other guy. So how do you guys measure that? I don't know. I, I have a, just a, 
just the burning innate thing of just executing whatever it is. So, you know, you're right. Like we, you know, one example, for instance, is uh, we design our own photonic chips here and then we send them off to foundries. So in that case, it's a, a very explicit deadline. We need the chip designs in a three or four weeks time. They'll have more heads up notice, but there's a deadline there that we need to hit. Otherwise, we'll miss the cycle, we'll be out of phase and we'll have to wait, you know, another three or four, six months. So in those sorts of things, and it's just about, well, we have a deadline, we have to hit it. We don't have any, any excuses there. With other stuff like that, you know, product market fit and all business sort of side of things, well, we don't have the computer yet, but we want to sign up customers to start using small quantum. We have small quantum computers to start using that. I don't know. It's just something that is innate for me particularly. And just, I use mm -hmm. Slack all the time day or night and just you know where are we up to you know yeah. bothering people with that so i don't think it's any different it's more the mentality and just making sure that there's always something to do therefore there's always a, a deadline in some yeah. sense yeah uh, yeah yeah um uh last question for you before we open it up i wanted to ask about um you know the kind of international uh, concerns or opportunities with regards to building quantum in Canada. Um, does it uh, help you to be in Canada versus the US? Um, does it uh, hinder you in any way? Um, how do some of our competitors in, in China or Taiwan um, play into your world? I'd love to understand more about that dynamic from your perspective. Yeah, we think it's great being in Canada. I, I think it's... Um like Singapore and Australia, Canada, the Canadian, the governments in those countries have really supported, at least from a university research point of view, the last two or three decades. So there's talent here. So we, we would love to um, keep working with people here in, in Canada. There's CDL and others that are, you know, a lot of quantum companies and startups. So it's a great environment ecosystem to be part of. In fact, we're thinking of opening up in another office in Australia, maybe Singapore as well, just because of the talent there. And, and Canada has a long history of that. Also, because of the long history of the Canadian government, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, we use shred. So I think this year we're up to maybe $1.8 million in, in getting cred shred credits back. We start off probably 100,000, now we're up to there. And quantum is, fits the category perfectly. It's definitely R&D. So that's been great. Uh, you know, going for other ones like FedDev and SIF and working with, you know, BDC investing in us, which we're thankful for and others. Having that history of quantum computing in the Canadian Canadian government psyche has is, is been helpful from a funding point of view. So it's mm -hmm. it's great to be in Canada. Also, it's not far from the US. And so mm -hmm. you compare it to Australia and other places in terms of recruiting people, having conversations, interview. You don't have to be skewed by the time zones and so forth. In terms of China, um, that, that's tricky. I, I think a lot of you know, invest, there's a lot of money going in, into, into that environment at the moment. I think they're doing a great job from an academic point of view. Some companies getting started there or, or started, I think that'll just increase exponentially over the coming years. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously the Chinese government is very much promoting quantum and technologies in general. Uh, you know, it's, it's tricky in terms of, you've got the national security side of things right. from Canada and uh, it's, it's deeply, tied to the U.S.'s interests, uh, understandably as well. So you got to be careful uh, in some sense. And it's hard to understand how the geopolitical stuff, it doesn't seem to be at its greatest at the moment. And I don't know if it's going to get worse, and particularly with quantum, how that looks. So questioning whether you take out, you know, Chinese investment uh, is a big thing we should all be concerned about, and customers and hiring uh, as well. But they're doing a lot of great stuff. And I think it also is great having that kind of competitor because uh, I think it then drives, at least in quantum, while the Canadian and U.S. governments are like, well, we can't fall behind. So I think that's right. a good thing. Qu quantum, if quantum is successful, it's bigger than any one company and bigger than any one country. So all of this stuff, I think, is good in general.